story five of the human boy by eden philpotts this librivox recording is in the public domain story five the piebald rat it was all the result of old briggs asking the doctor if he might instil the lads with a wholesome fondness for natural history that's how he put it because i heard him and the doctor said it was an admirable notion and would very probably keep some boys out of mischief on half holidays it also kept some boys out of bounds on half holidays and after a time i think the doctor was pretty savage with old briggs and wished he'd stuck to his regular work which was writing and drawing and such like because when one or two of the chaps really got keen about natural history and even chucked cricket for butterflies and beetles others who didn't care a straw about it pretended they did to gain their own ends and it was these chaps if you understand who finally made the doctor so sick with natural history generally and old briggs for starting it my chum west began the rage for study of our humble relations as old briggs called everything down to woodlice he let it be generally known that he had two live lizards in his desk and this being the best thing that west had ever thought of the idea caught on well i had a dormouse myself my name being ashby minor and ashby major kept a spider pretty nearly as big as a young bird which he had poked out of a hole in the playground wall he caged it in a tin match-box and fed it with blue bottles and wasps at least he got blue bottles and wasps for it but the fool wouldn't eat them and after a week he found it with its legs all tucked up as neatly as anything only it was dead i thought the match-box must have been too tight a fit for it but ashby major did not he believed there was something about a tin match-box which must be rather poisonous for outdoor spiders then chaps went on collecting till it got to be swagger to keep big live things in your desk and the bigger the thing the more swagger it was maine generally known as freckles had a couple of guinea pigs in his desk for a week then mannering the classical master in the fifth who must have had a nose like a gimlet smelt them at prayers happening to come in late and kneeling down by freckles at the time the doctor didn't make much fuss then because that was just at the beginning of the business only he said a desk was not the place for guinea pigs and added that a chap in freckles position in the school ought to have known it he let the gardener look after them from that time forward but freckles naturally lost all interest in them after the gardener had them because a guinea pig merely as a guinea pig is nothing anyhow it was rough on him to be landed over it because as a matter of fact guinea pigs have no scent worth mentioning and nobody but mannering would have spotted them after that gideon and brooks caught a blind worm one foot two inches long and gideon sold his half for five pence so brooks got it all nobody knew what a blind worm likes to eat unfortunately and it died but not for a fortnight then there was another scene with my dormouse which led to tremendous things there's a hole in a desk where the ink-pot goes in and one day my mouse got out through it having climbed up two dictionaries and a greek testament to do so it happened old briggs himself was taking the lower fourth which is my class and i hoped it would be all right but he didn't seem friendly over it and i noticed when he told us to find the mouse he put his feet upon the rungs of his chair it's a rum thing about old briggs that he doesn't care much for natural history objects while they're alive he likes them dead and dried or stuffed and pinned on cards or in glass cases all labelled and neat my dormouse gave us a jolly good hunt round then it finally tripped over a lead pencil and got its tail and hind legs into west's ink so we caught it and i was drying it with a piece of blotting paper and old briggs was just telling us that dormice belong to a genus of rodents called meopsis and are allied to mice though they have a squirrel's habits which he seemed to think was a pity when dunston came in the doctor asked particulars looked as if he could have jolly well killed my mouse which was shivering rather badly owing to the ink on its hinder parts and said once for all that he would allow no animals of any kind inside any of the desks or in school then unluckily as an afterthought he demanded a clearance on the spot and he was pretty well staggered to find the result 
i will ask you ferrars as head boy of the class and one i am happy to think above any of this childish folly to inspect the desks one by one and report to me where you find indications of life said the doctor ferrars is always right with the doctor chiefly because he has a face like a stone angel in church and a very smooth voice and a remarkably swagger knowledge of the scriptures he is also a tremendous worker and will go into the upper fourth next term as sure as eggs it was jolly awkward for ferrars then because he happened to be one of the keenest natural history chaps of all and had a piebald rat which even fellows in the sixth had offered him half a crown and three shillings for yet he would not part with it so though we didn't like him much we felt almost sorry for the fix he was in now of course we thought that such a demon on religious knowledge as ferrars would drag out his piebald rat right away and perhaps even give it to the doctor or offer to sell it for the alms box but he didn't he got up rather white about the gills and opened the desks one by one and a jolly happy family it was only the doctor scattered the things to the four winds till there wasn't an atom of natural history left in the whole classroom except ferrars piebald rat snug in his desk first fowl who goes in for water things had to empty his jam jar of tadpoles out into the playground which was a beastly cruel thing to make him do because they all died still being in the gill stage then freckles was sent off with a young rabbit to the hayfield and he got caned too because strangely enough the doctor hadn't forgotten his guinea pigs and morant's two sparrows were let go which was no kindness to them because morant had cut their wings so jolly short it would have taken them months to grow enough feathers to fly with and meantime a cat got them both and playfair's mole which by the way had been queer for some time owing to having no earth to burrow in was ordered to be sent to the cricket field there were a lot of other things but corky minima scored rather because his goat sucker moth laid a hundred and fourteen eggs on todd hunter's algebra a few hours before it was let free corky minimus says a goat sucker moth's nothing worth mentioning after it's laid eggs but the eggs turn into fine caterpillars the few things the doctor didn't know what to do with and didn't like to have killed he said must be given to the gardener he thought it would be better to put my mouse out of its misery and turned it over on my hand with a gold pencil case and said it had probably got a chill to its vital organs and would die but old briggs explained that it might live if put in cotton wool so the gardener looked to it and it did live and i took it home at the end of that term and have it still though it is getting oldish now and has lost half its tail but it's a good mouse yet of course the extraordinary thing was ferrars after the doctor had gone old briggs to whom he had whispered something before he went gave out that his natural history half hours would be suspended for the rest of the term then i got a word with ferrars i said how ever did you have the cheek you supposed to be such a saint he said i don't know something came over me to do it i've got a jolly peculiar feeling to that rat it's not an ordinary rat i'm wrapped up in it even my respect for the doctor couldn't stand against it i know what you chaps think i dare say you reckon i'm a hound but i couldn't help doing what i did somehow that rat's a sort of mascot to me a mascot's a thing that brings luck all my best luck's happened since i had it of course when a chap goes on like that what can you do i didn't understand ferrars he seemed to me to be simply talking rot so i said well it's pretty measly considering the opinion the doctor's got of you i shan't try to score off your rat because i know it's a jolly fine one and i like it but freckles or somebody will very likely kill it after this he looked in a fair funk when the dreaded thought of having his rat killed came to him before the end of that day he spoke to every chap in the class separately and all but three promised and swore not to lay a finger on the rat but freckles murdoch and morant wouldn't swear finally he paid morant sixpence and so got him over and murdoch he let crib off him and prep three times and freckles who was an awfully sportsmanlike chap really said he was only rotting all the time and would be the last to do a classy rat like ferrars any harm in fact he said he'd much sooner kill ferrars himself 
mind you though of course it was simply barbarous for ferrars to think that his piebald rat could have any effect on his work yet he proved to me that his success in school and his great popularity with the doctor dated from the coming of the thing when he first got it it was a mere cub rat so to say now though not a year old it had turned into as fine a rat as you could wish to meet anywhere in appearance it had pink eyes and a white head and a fairish amount of white fur about the body which got thinner on its stomach so that you could see the pink skin through to some extent but the piebaldness of the rat was the great feature it had two big round patches of fur like the common or garden rat and one small patch at the nape of its neck and in addition to this it had one large patch of beautiful yellowish fur such as you chiefly see on guinea pigs its tail was pink and long and quite hairless ferrars often kept back good things at meals for it and the bond between them seemed to grow rummer and rummer till he let the rat get on his mind and wilson said he was getting dotty about it which i think was true for one day going into the classroom to get a knife from my desk i saw ferrars with his rat out talking to it he was swatting like anything in play hours for a special old testament history prize and he had the rat and the bible and various books of reference all before him then not knowing i was there he spoke i must win it main reed stick to me this time old chap and see me through he called his rat main reed because that was his favorite author and main reed seemed to understand and he turned his pink eyes on to the open bible and walked over it finding he'd walked over the ninth chapter of the second book of kings ferrars got excited and seeing me said by jove then i'll learn that chapter by heart though it is so long it's good exciting stuff anyway and i bet my rat walking over it means that there'll be a question about jehu and jezebel you'll go cracked about that rat i said it's part of my life he answered i know it seems very peculiar and so it is and i don't suppose such a thing ever happened before but something tells me my prosperity and success is all bound up in that rat he's a familiar spirit in fact like saul had if he died i should never do much more good and very likely stick in this class for the rest of my days you'd better not think like that i said because rats are short-lived things owing to the nasty food they eat not that maine reed has nasty food but all pink-eyed animals are delicate and you'll have to lose him sooner or later ferrars didn't take warning by me but after he really did win the old testament prize and there really was a question about jezebel he made a sort of idol out of the rat and some chaps declared he said his prayers to it i know he constantly bought it coconut chips which it was very fond of he trained it too to live in his breast pocket and i often saw him glancing down in class just to get a glimpse of its little eyes looking up at him that taking the piebald rat into class shows the lengths ferrars ran the whole thing was very peculiar some chaps said there was a strong likeness growing up between ferrars and the rat and certainly his thin white face had a rattish look sometimes other fellows told him his rat was an evil spirit and would end by doing him a bad turn but ferrars turned upon them and jawed them with such frightful language that they never said it again meanwhile the doctor went on taking to ferrars more and more and there seemed every chance of his getting the whole bible by heart before he left merivale then came the end of the affair like this ferrars was so dependent on his rat now that he wouldn't do a lesson without it and he lugged it fearlessly into the doctor's study at those times fortunately rare when the doctor took our class himself in scripture but ferrars was such a flyer that we all got tarred with the same brush and the doctor after questioning ferrars for half an hour about bible people we'd never even heard of and getting a string of dead right answers out of him would dismiss us all in great good temper forgetting that he'd only been having a go at one chap a day came when the doctor left us for five minutes in the middle of the class and while most of us had a hurried dip into the plagues of egypt which was the business in hand ferrars who knew as much about the plagues as ever moses did just got out his rat and gave it a bit of almond and a short breather of a yard or so along the floor 
but the doctor coming back suddenly he had only just time to pop it into his pocket and even then he put the rat into an unusual pocket which it was not accustomed to and didn't like namely a trouser pocket ferrars also shoved a handkerchief down in the pocket to steady the rat then i saw an awful rum expression come over him and he grabbed at the pocket and his mouth fell open and his face got the colour of new putty at the same time i saw his eyes turn to a big bookshelf with glass doors against the side of the room what's the matter ferrars said the doctor you appear unwell oh nothing sir uh, merely a little passing sickness i think then withdraw my boy and ask the matron to give you a few drops of brandy and water you need not dine to-day said the doctor very kindly but ferrars wouldn't withdraw he knew main reed had got through his pocket and down his trouser leg he also knew it was now behind the bookshelf and might reappear at any moment so he said he was better and actually that it would be a grief to him to miss one of the doctor's own lessons but afterwards when the rat didn't come out and the class was dismissed ferrars was frightful to see his hair all got on end somehow and his eyes swelled and stuck out of his head like glass beads and his cheeks got hollow he ran awful risk going into the doctor's study that day but the rat wouldn't come out and ferrars looked old enough to be a master when he went to bed though only eleven and a half really one of two things has happened he said to me for we were in the same dormitory either it's got wedged in behind the bookshelf and will die if not let out or else there was a rat hole there and it went down and has joined common rats and become a sort of king rat among them or been killed i said no they would not kill it he answered anyway to-morrow after the doctor's class is over and everybody is gone i shall stop and make a clean breast of it and ask him for the sake of humanity to have the bookshelf moved but it's all up with me if the rat has lost its feeling towards me and won't come back only if it was stuck and couldn't come back that's different he didn't sleep much that night but he said some prayers which was a thing he didn't often do and of course he was praying that the piebald rat might be allowed to return but next day after the scripture class in which ferrars was not nearly so much to the front as usual and got regularly muddled over a potty question about jacob the doctor saved him the trouble of asking about his rat he uh, the doctor i mean had been jolly glum all through class and when it was ended he did a rum thing which was awful to see knowing all we did he told us to keep our places then went to the fireplace and picked up the shovel from the face of it he removed a bit of newspaper and under the newspaper was main reed his pink eyes had gone foggy and there was a little streak of blood on his mouth otherwise his body looked all right now here said the doctor in an awfully solemn way we have a dead piebald rat there can be no outlet for error concerning such a rat as this to have seen such a rat is to remember it already three classes have been before me to-day but nobody knew anything about this animal that it was a tame rat its fatness and sleekness testify moreover the piebald rat is an outcome of artificiality a wild rat in a state of nature is brown or black as the case may be this rat then had an owner and that owner brought it into my study my study and suffered it to escape there that i do well to be angry you will the more easily understand when i tell you that the unsavoury creature was upon my desk last night and has scratched and even eaten some papers whereon were notes for my next sermon it was discovered this morning by one of the domestics she seeing some object moving upon my desk struck with the broom handle and destroyed this rat now let there be no prevarication or evasion of the question i am going to put to you first i wish to know if this rat belongs or rather belonged to any among you and secondly i desire to learn whether supposing the rat be not the property of any present you happen to know whose property it is or rather was 
i stole a look at ferrars and he appeared so frightful to see that for some reason i thought i'd try and help him so like a fool i was just going to speak when young corky minimus did he said please sir it might be a foreign sort of a rat that came over in that box of pineapples and things that ashby major had sent him from the west indies when i desire your aid in the elucidation of this problem i will apply for it corky minimus answered the doctor so corky dried up then in a sort of voice that was strange to us and seemed to come from his stomach or somewhere new ferrars spoke and i never saw a chap look so ghastly his eyes were fixed on the rat and he came forward slowly please sir it was my rat he said yours ferrars you to disobey you of all boys to set my orders at defiance it wasn't an ordinary rat sir i can see what sort of rat it was sir for myself thundered the doctor this it is to consider a boy to devote thought to him to particularly commend him for his theological knowledge i don't take any credit for knowing anything now sir it was the rat as much as me robert ferrars said the doctor in his caning voice you are now adding wicked buffoonery to an act in itself sufficiently disreputable i can't explain sir i don't mean any buffoonery that rat was more to me than you'd think it it did help me somehow and now it's dead it wouldn't be sportsmanlike to it to say not and if you'll let me b b bury it properly i'll be very thankful to you the doctor looked at ferrars awfully close during this speech either you are lying he said or you suffer from some hysterical and neurotic condition robert ferrars which i have neither suspected nor discovered until this moment then he told us to go but ferrars he kept for half an hour and when ferrars came in to dinner i saw he'd been blubbing he explained to me after we'd gone to bed he said no he didn't cane me or anything he just talked and told me a lot about several things i didn't know and said that familiar spirits were specially barred in the bible i never thought he'd have even tried to understand me but he did and he quite saw my side about the rat he said kind words over it too and was sorry it was dead and i've got to see dr barnes to-morrow too though of course it's only having my rat on my mind that's upset me and he let me have it to b bury gladly where shall you arrange the rat i said i'm sending it home in a strays box that jane gave me i've written to my sister where to bury it jane it was who killed it she cried like anything when i told her what main reed was to me but he's in the book post by now beautifully done up in shavings and fresh geranium leaves it's no good talking any more only i will say that if he was a familiar spirit he was a jolly good one very different to the sort barred in the scriptures i don't know how i'll get on in the exams now i wish i was dead too then he sniffed a bit and went to sleep End of story five. Story six of the Human Boy by Eden Philpotts. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story six: Brown, Bradwell, and Me. There's more stuff talked about fagging at school than anything else in the world, as far as I can see. And being the smallest boy, but two at Dunstan's and a fag myself, I ought to know. Of course, fags do get it pretty hot sometimes if they happen to fag for a beast, but big fellows aren't beasts to small ones as a general thing. I'm sure Bradwell was the best chap that ever came to Dunstan's, and when he was expelled over the siege in the wing dormitory, him and Trelawney, I felt frightful. I'm Watson Minor myself, my brother being Watson Major, one of the reserves for the second eleven and captain of the third the thing i'm going to write out happened just before the siege and was all over before that and it shows what a fag can do it also shows what a jolly good thing it is for big fellows to treat fags well and give them odds and ends so as to get their affection if i hadn't felt what i did to bradwell i shouldn't have run the awful risks i did for him what i did certainly ruined a great project of bradwell's and upset him a good bit at the time but he said afterwards when the blow had fallen and when he could look back and think of it without smacking my head that i had meant well 
i remember his very words for that matter he said your intentions were all right i will say that but you've ruined my life no chap could say fairer than that and mind you i did ruin his life in a way i've heard many fellows say bradwell was a bounder by birth but he never was to me well bradwell had a great admiration for mabel dunstan the doctor's youngest daughter but one and she had an equal great admiration for him for two terms bradwell although a great sportsman in other ways was fond of girls if he passed a school of them he would look awfully rum and reddish in the face and watery in the eyes once going with him to the playing field for a football match he made the distance half a mile longer by going up a side street to avoid the high school girls and i asked him why and he said it was cheek but told me all the same he said you can't meet women got up like this bradwell has frightfully thin calves to his legs when seen in knickers though he is the best goalkeeper that was ever known at dunstan's of course his affair with mabel dunstan would never have got to be known by me but for my great use to bradwell in carrying notes being in the doctor's house that term i was easily able to do this and there was a jar of green stuff in the hall where she told me to leave the notes which i did she was fifteen i believe or else sixteen but well on in years anyway and a few months older than bradwell it was his general brilliance won her for he could do anything and his father had plenty of money being a man like whiteley's in london only in the north of england bradwell drew almost as well as pictures in books and he used to illustrate the latin grammar for his special chums there's a part of the latin grammar called syntax which i haven't come to yet myself but it has rather rummy things in it with both the latin and english of them and bradwell used to illustrate these things and he illustrated two in my grammar out of pure kindness to me one was balbus is crowning the boy's head with a garland and the other was a snake appeared to sulla while sacrificing and you never saw anything better they were done on the margin in ink and the snake appearing to sulla was about the queerest and best thing ever seen in a latin grammar i have to tell you this because such a lot happened owing to it now brown took my class which is the lowest in the school and i am seventh in it and i gradually got to hate brown because bradwell did and for other reasons of my own too brown was said to be only twenty-two and he looked younger than many of the chaps his moustache being whitish and invisible to the eye he wore neckties which i remember hearing mathers say were an insult to nature and would have made a rainbow curl up and faint we always noticed at arithmetic times that brown if he got a stumper would put up the lid of his private desk and hide behind it of course looking the thing up in his crib then he would wander round as if by accident to the chap and do the sum off quick while he remembered it bradwell always hated him and when he found that brown was very friendly with mabel and mabel was very friendly with brown he hated him far far worse bradwell and this girl had a row in the shrubbery at the back of the chapel and i being in the gardener's potting shed at the time feeding a caterpillar of mine heard it bradwell said i'm not blind mabel i've seen it going on ever since last term you read his beastly books and leave rosebuds with scented verbena leaves around them in that stone urn at the gate when he comes down from his house to class and she said and why shouldn't i you must remember please that i am my own mistress besides the intelligence of a grown-up man is very refreshing for some reason bradwell didn't like this his voice squeaked up into his head in a rather rum way when he answered do you call him a man he hasn't got a muscle on him and he doesn't know more than enough to teach the kids that's merely mean jealousy said mabel of course he doesn't talk to you or show you what is in him but he tells me all about his secret life and very beautiful it is he is a genius in fact if it comes to that what can he do said bradwell awfully cleverly can he draw no he doesn't draw oh can he sing no can he play the piano no now all of these things bradwell could do to perfection so he got cheerfuller and cheerfuller what can he do then besides jaw the kids and always sneak to the doctor 
i never saw such jealousy as this said mabel but if you must know i'll tell you what he can do he can write poetry out of his own head and he has got a solid book of it ready to print some day there i suppose bradwell couldn't write poetry anyway he got very down in the face at this he didn't say anything appearing to be frightfully shocked at what he'd heard then mabel said when you can quote browning and byron and shelley and write poems yourself it will be soon enough to sneer at mr brown you love him said bradwell in a very tragic voice i don't love anybody but my own family said mabel but i admire him and i admire his poetry which is very much out of the common indeed it's all over then i suppose said bradwell i don't know what you mean she replied to him a thing that has never begun can't be all over which words of mabel's seemed to knock the heart out of bradwell then the gardener came along and i didn't hear anything else of course i couldn't help hearing what i had done though i tried hard not to and kept feeding my caterpillar like anything all the time two days after i had to carry another note to mabel i found one waiting for bradwell in the usual place so they must have made it up then came the beginning of my misfortunes with brown he found the snake appearing to sulla in my latin grammar and called me up and said he knew very well i hadn't drawn it myself but wanted to know who had he said it was wrong to the doctor to ruin our books and that he had seen in several different books the same snake evidently done by the same boy owing to them being so much similar but the very identical thing had happened in another class to steggles bradwell having drawn him the same picture and knowing what steggles said being a chap who is frightfully cunning i said the same now to brown i said i left the book on my desk and somebody came along and done it while i was out of the room brown seemed inclined not to believe this anyway he took the latin grammar away with him but i heard no more about it till the next evening when i wanted the book in prep remembering brown had it i went off to his study and knocked and walked in brown wasn't there for the moment and the room was empty i took the opportunity to look at a rather beautiful tobacco jar of brown's which i have seen at a distance on his mantelpiece many times passing his table to get to it i chanced to glance there and judge of my surprise when the first words i saw at the top of a big sheet of paper were to mabel underneath was a lot of writing and the whole table seemed to be littered with paper covered with small bits of separate writing much of it scratched out and done over again but the piece with to mabel at the top was all beautiful and clean without anything scratched being i suppose the result of all the other bits put together and neatly copied out well there i was with my duty towards bradwell as his fag brown had evidently done a verse out of his own head for mabel dunstan and had written it in this beautiful style on thick white paper to send to her i felt if she got it knowing what she'd said to bradwell about brown that it was certain she would abandon bradwell him not being any good at poems i wouldn't have done it for anybody else in the world but bradwell i wouldn't have done it at all if i had known what the end of it was going to be but anyway at the time it seemed to me as bradwell's fag i ought to do it and so i did i took the poem and rolled it up so as not to hurt it and hooked off to bradwell he was in his study and trelawney who shares it with him being out of the room i was able to explain i said if you please bradwell i've come from mr brown's study and he was not there and happening by a curious accident to glance on the table i saw this and knowing about you and mabel and being your fag i took it took what said bradwell i put the thing in front of him and he got red and excited it's a poem to mabel by that beast brown he said then he read it out half to himself but i heard the thing ran like this to mabel oh let my muse sing to the name of mabel whose azure eyes are fastened to my soul like to forget-me-nots in buttonhole to tell of my heart's torment i'm unable my thoughts they spin my brain it grows unstable when fixed on thee perchance it is my role never to reach my mad ambition's goal but to live ere midst celastic babble thy glances brighten all my lonely lot 
prometheus like a vulture gnaws my heart in biting blasts and under sunshine hot my dreams are shattered by a barbed dart and walking wild i scream that i may not whisper the oaths i yearn to thee impart i told bradwell i didn't quite understand it and he sat on me you wouldn't he said a kid like you but i do it's a sonnet and an extremely fine one i hate the chap but it's no good pretending he's not a poet because this jolly well proves he is look at the rhymes and the smoothness it seems a heroic thing of bradwell to say that feeling as he did to brown he thought for a bit but told me not to go of course he said this must be returned all's fair in a case of this kind but then he thought very deeply and read the sonnet again suddenly he took a bit of paper and copied down brown's poem word for word then he told me to cut back like lightning to brown's study and to put the poem back on his desk if i could if not to most carefully keep it till the first chance of getting it back to brown's room without being spotted you're a splendid fag he said and i shan't forget this it's the sort of thing that squires did for their knights in olden times and they got good rewards too now hook it it's worth a lot mind you to get praise like that from such a chap as bradwell when i got back brown was rummaging over his table and swearing a good deal in a loud whisper he told me to wait a minute and went off to look in his bedroom then i seized my opportunity and slipped the sonnet on his table under some papers when he came back he was worried and went on hunting till he found it then he said ah to himself and got pleasanter and asked me what i wanted i told him my latin grammar and being in a very happy state now owing to finding the poem he gave my book back and told me to clear out which i did after prep i met bradwell going into prayers and he handed me a note for mabel to put in the usual place he looked awfully rum when he gave it to me and he saw that i saw he looked rum so he said i don't mind letting you know owing to your being such a good fag and my trusting you as i do you may read the letter in prayers then seal it down and put it behind the pot of ferns in the hall in the usual place of course it wasn't really a letter or bradwell wouldn't have let me read it it was just brown's sonnet copied out by bradwell word for word and at the bottom were the words what about poetry now a t b a t b are bradwell's initials his full name being arthur thomas bradwell you see he didn't exactly say he'd written the sonnet he only said what about poetry now the excitement of it all kept me awake for hours and hours through the night i don't suppose any fag ever did more for a big fellow than i had done for bradwell that day then i began to wonder when brown would send off his poem and whether mabel would get them both together or one at a time you see of course brown would send her the thing as original and there was nothing in bradwell's letter to exactly say he hadn't written it and puzzling the thing out for hours and hours i at last came to the conclusion that she would find it very difficult which to believe because how could she know which was telling the truth to her then about three or four in the morning almost i began to feel rather terrible over it because i thought of what frightful trouble brown must have had to write the sonnet he might have taken terms and terms over it for all i could tell not of course knowing myself how long it took to write poetry i felt rather sorry for brown but after all a chap's duty is to the fella he fags for before masters and feeling that i went to sleep three days later bradwell had me in his room and told me the end of it all which shows that a girl never does what you might expect as a lesson to you young watson said bradwell i may tell you that my career has been utterly blighted and my life ruined by that business of the sonnet i said i was sorry to hear it he said yes blighted and so's his i mean brown's she got my letter that night and his next morning that night she felt all her old feeling for me return because of the sonnet thinking i'd done it then next morning she got just the very same stuff to a word from brown with a letter saying he had burned the midnight oil to compose it well there you are what does she do instead of accepting my statement being the first she argues in a most elaborate way that i couldn't possibly have copied from brown and brown couldn't possibly have copied from me 
but it would have been too much of a coincidence if we'd both written exactly the same sonnet out of our own heads so what does she conclude i said i didn't know why fat head that we both copied it from somebody else out of some book by some well-known proper dead poet i've no doubt now on thinking over it that brown did do that because when i first read his poem i could hardly believe that he had written such real poetry owing to the rhymes and smoothness but it's all over now she's written a letter i can't show you to hope even for her friendship wouldn't be any good a girl hates a joke something frightful how about brown i said she's written to him also asking him where he got the verses out of and explaining she doesn't believe they are original and saying how another acquaintance of hers had sent the very same lot the day before so now you see what a sinful mess you've made of it i said i did but i felt it was my duty to him yes i know he said but the question is what do i do now you see all's fair and all that but now being out of the hunt ought i to throw up the sponge and tell the truth or ought i not i don't know bradwell i said but anyway you won't mention me i hope because i only acted for you and did a jolly dangerous thing no you're safe enough and in fact i'm going to reward you for what you did do said bradwell but seeing i'm out of it i think it will be a manly act to brown if i tell mabel frankly that i resorted to strategy but me i said i shall merely inform her answered bradwell that one of my emissaries found the poem and of course brought it to me that i dispatched it as a joke taking care not to say i was the author i shall end with these words brown is innocent all of which he did and i left the letter in the usual spot but mabel cut him altogether from that day and he told me girls have no humour and laughed it off though he felt it a lot and often smacked my head out of bitterness of mind afterwards but not hard he gave me an old knife for a reward but told me at the same time never to do anything for him again without being commanded as for mabel she threw over brown just like she threw over bradwell in spite of bradwell's letter and bradwell said it was a nemesis whatever that is and i had a nemesis too because a week afterwards bradwell threw over me and made young west his fag i felt hurt but of course that didn't get known to bradwell and if i fag again i won't so much as make a piece of toast unless i'm commanded to End of story six. Story seven of the human boy by eden philpotts this librivox recording is in the public domain story seven gideon's front tooth i believe gideon was the only jew that ever came to dunstan's and i expect taking it all round he might have had a better time at a school for jews in general though in one way he wouldn't have done as well and wouldn't have had the adventure with old grimble which turned out so splendidly for him when old grimble died though easily the richest chap at merivale and getting no less than ten shillings a week pocket money gideon was so awfully fond of coin that he hardly spent a penny and the only thing he did with his money was to lend it to fellows he didn't lend it for nothing having a curious system by which you paid in marbles or bats or knives for the money and in spite of that still had to pay back the money itself after a certain time you signed a paper and gideon said that if chaps hadn't paid back the tin on the dates named it would be very serious for them but it got serious for him after a bit because steggles who knew quite as much about money as gideon though he never had any borrowed a whole pound once and promised to pay five shillings for it for one term and gideon was new to steggles then and agreed but when the time of payment came steggles said that gideon had better regard it as a bad debt because he wasn't going to pay back even the original pound then gideon thought a bit and asked him why and steggles told him he said because you know jolly well the doctor doesn't allow chaps to lend money and gideon said this is the first time i've heard that 
anyway it's usury which is a crime said steggles and i'm not going to pay anything and being less than twenty-one you can't make me so it amounts to a bad debt as i told you just now you've done jolly well one way and another and you've got two bats and lord knows how many india-rubber balls and cricket balls and silver pencils and knives out of it including ashby miner's watch-chain which is silver and if you take my tip you'll keep quiet because once all these kids get to know anybody under twenty-one can borrow money without returning it then it's all up with your beastly financial schemes gideon was remarkably surprised to know what a lot steggles had found out about him and accused him of looking into his play-chest and steggles said he had then gideon went and about three chaps who had heard the talk told others and they told still more chaps until finally a good many fellows who owed gideon money felt there was no hurry about paying it back till it happened to be convenient in fact gideon jolly soon saw he couldn't do any more good for himself like that and at the beginning of the next term when chaps were pretty flush of coin he wrote up in the gym there will be a sale of bats knives and other various useful articles between two and three o'clock by auction on tuesday j gideon somebody tore it down but not before most fellows had read it and when gideon and young miller who had a bat in the auction and hoped to get it back if possible were seen carrying gideon's play chest to the gym after dinner on the appointed day of course we went it passed off very well for gideon because the things were really good and often almost new he seemed to know all about auctions and hit the chest with a stump and explained the things and what good points they had about them he only took money down and i will say nobody could have done it fairer if a knife had a broken blade for instance or a bat was slightly sprung which happened with one he always pointed it out so that nobody could say he had been choused over it young miller got back his bat for four shillings and eight pence and ashby minor got back his silver chain for thirteen shillings but it wasn't much good to him because in order to raise the thirteen bob he had to raffle the chain at once at shilling shares and he took one hoping to be lucky but he wasn't foul unfortunately getting it gideon told me afterwards that the sale came out fairly but not quite what he had hoped he rather sneered at the dunstan chaps in general and said they were a poverty-stricken crew which got me into a bait and i told him that i'd sooner be the son of an officer in the royal navy which i am than the biggest jew diamond dealer in the world his father being in that profession he said there was no accounting for tastes but he would have thought that a man who could deliberately go and be a sailor must be weak in the head then i punched him and he instantly went down and apologized i may mention that i am bray the cock of the lower school before coming to gideon's front tooth just to let you know exactly the chap he was i'll mention another thing he did an old woman was allowed to bring up fruit and tuck generally and sell it to us after morning school steggles who knows the reason for pretty nearly everything said this was permitted by dr dunstan to take the edge off our appetites but anyway the old woman sold strawberries and raspberries in summer time and these were arranged with cabbage leaves in little wicker baskets at about four pence each well one day gideon who never refused to eat fruit if offered it but very seldom bought any asked the old woman what she gave for the wicker baskets and she said three pence a dozen then he asked her what she would give for those which had been used once and she thought and said they would be worth at least three halfpence a dozen to her he didn't say any more but after that it was a rum thing how all the used baskets which generally were seen kicking about the playground in shoals disappeared nobody noticed it at the time but afterwards we remembered clearly that they had disappeared and just at the end of the term a chap hurrying in late after the bell rang came bang on gideon and the old woman round a corner out of sight of the gates and the chap saw gideon give her a pile of baskets and get three halfpence of course it was the last three halfpence he ever got that way because when it became known the chaps rendered their baskets useless for commerce in many ways and barlow called gideon shylock minor when he heard that he'd made two shillings and fivepence halfpenny which name stuck to gideon forever 
and steggles got nine other chaps to subscribe a penny each and buy a pound of flesh from a butcher's shop because in shakespeare shylock was death on his pound of flesh the pound was put under gideon's pillow by steggles himself and when gideon shoved his watch under his pillow which he always did at night he found it and steggles said he turned pale but read what was pinned on the pound of flesh and then smiled and wrapped the meat up in a letter from home and said what fools you chaps are wasting money like that but it looks all right and will mean a good feed for nothing next day he got up very early and took his pound of flesh down to the kitchen and got them to cook it and he ate about half before breakfast and had the rest cold in his desk during monsieur michel's lesson which was a safe time and steggles said we ought to have gone one better and put poison on it the great affair of the tooth came on at the beginning of next term and first i must tell you that next door to dunston's lived an old man so frightfully ancient that his skin was all shrivelled over his bones he didn't like boys much but he would look over his garden wall sometimes into our playground and scowl if anybody caught his eye various things of course went over the wall often and it was one of the excitements of dunston's to go into old grimble's yard and get them back twice only he caught a chap and both times despite his awful age and yellowness of skin he thrashed the chap very fairly hard with a walking stick but he never reported anybody to dunston and it was generally thought he regarded it as a sort of sport hunting for chaps in his garden of course in fair open hunting he hadn't a chance and the two he did catch he caught by stealth hiding behind bushes in a rather dark evening well the facts would never have been known about this tooth but for gideon's mean spirit it happened to be necessary for him to fight me and though not caring much about it he couldn't help himself besides though the champion of the lower school i was tons smaller than gideon and gideon didn't know till after the fight that i was a champion the true facts about my greatness being hid from him just before the fight gideon said oh my tooth by the way it may hurt and it cost my father five guineas so to our great interest he unscrewed one of his two top front teeth and gave it to his second you couldn't have told it was a sham so remarkably was it done and it screwed on to the foundation of the original tooth much like a spike screws into the sole of a cricket boot gideon had fallen downstairs when he was ten and knocked off half the tooth so he told us but murray who is well up in science said that all jews front teeth are rather rocky because in feudal times they were pulled out with pincers as a form of torture and to make the jews give up their secret treasures murray said that after many generations of pulling out nature got sick of it and that in modern times the front teeth of jews aren't worth talking about murray is full of rum ideas like that and he hopes to go in for engineering having already many secret inventions waiting to be patented as to gideon i licked him rather badly in two rounds and a half then he was mopped up and dressed and screwed in his front tooth again with the greatest ease once it got known about this tooth and fellows were naturally excited Stegel said it was on the principle of a tobacco pipe mouthpiece and finding the chaps were keen to see it gideon let it be generally known he would freely show it to anybody for three pence a time and to friends for two pence but this was a safe reduction to make because properly speaking he hadn't any friends seeing there were nearly two hundred boys at dunston's and that certainly half including several boys from the sixth took a pleasure in seeing the tooth and didn't mind the rather high charge gideon did jolly well and in the case of nubby tomkins he made actually one shilling and threepence because the tooth had a most peculiar fascination for nubby and he saw it no less than five times after that gideon made a reduction to him as well he might but somehow slade the head of the school was very averse to gideon's front tooth when he heard about it and he decided that there must be no more exhibition of it for money he told gideon so himself however a new boy came a week afterwards and heard about the strangeness of the tooth and offered a shilling in three installments to see it which was too much temptation for gideon and he showed it contrary to what slade had said 
slade of course heard for the new boy happened to be his own cousin though called saunders and then there was a curious scene in the playground which i fortunately saw slade came up to gideon in the very quiet way he has and asked him in a perfectly gentlemanly voice for his front tooth at first gideon seemed inclined not to give it up but he saw what an awfully serious thing that would be and finally unscrewed it though not willingly now said slade i'll have no more of this penny peep show business at merivale i told you once and you have disobeyed me so there's an end of your beastly tooth what's this he took something out of his pocket it's a catapult said gideon it is said slade and i'm going to use your tooth instead of a bullet and fire it into space it cost five guineas said gideon don't care if it cost a hundred answered slade still in a very gentlemanly sort of way we can't have this sort of thing here you know slade was just going to fire into space as he had said when a robin suddenly settled within thirty yards of us on the wall between the playground and old grimble's slade being a wonderful shot with a catapult having once shot a wood pigeon suddenly fired at the robin and only missed it by about four inches he said the shape of a front tooth was very unfavorable for shooting but anyway the tooth went over into grimble's and we distinctly heard it hit against the side of his house then slade went away and we rotted gideon rather because not having the tooth looked rum and made a difference in his voice he took it very quietly and said he rather thought his father would be able to summon slade and before evening school having marked down the spot where he fancied his tooth had hit grimble's house he went to look with a box of matches what happened afterwards he told us frankly and it was certainly true because with all his faults gideon never lied to anybody i went quietly over and began carefully looking along the bottom of the wall using a match to every foot or so he said and i had done about half when i heard a door open i then hooked it and ran almost on to old grimble he had not opened the door at all but was coming up the garden path at the critical moment of course he caught me he was going to rub it into me with his stick when i said i should think it very kind if he would hear me first as i had a perfectly good excuse for being there he said what excuse can you have for trespassing in my garden you little oily wretch oily wretch was what he called me and i said that my tooth had been fired into his garden that very day and about half-past one by a chap with a catapult and i lighted a match and showed him it was missing he said how the deuce are you going to find a tooth in a garden this size and i told him i had marked it down very carefully and that it had cost five guineas and that i rather believed my father would be able to summon the chap who had shot it away he seemed a good deal interested and said he thought very likely he might if it was robbery with violence then he asked me if i was the boy he had seen beating down the price of a purse at wilkinson's in merivale and i said i was then he said come in and have a bit of cake boy and i went in and had a bit of cake and saw on a shelf in his room about fifty or sixty cricket balls and various things which he had collared when they went over he asked me a lot of questions about different things and i answered them all he said was about money he also asked me to be good enough to value the things he had which came over the wall from time to time and i did and he thanked me they were worth fifteen shillings and tenpence and wright's ball which everybody thought was stolen by the milkman wasn't for old grimble had it and the milkman should be told and apologized to well he knew a lot about money and he told me he had thousands of gold sovereigns which he makes breed into thousands more he said you're the only boy i ever met with a grain of sense in his head now if i gave you a check on my bankers in merivale for five pounds to-day and wrote to you to-morrow morning to say i had changed my mind what would you do i said it would be too late sir because your check would have been sent off to my father that very night to put out at interest for me he said that's right never give back money or anything then he asked me my name and told me i might come back to-morrow and look for my tooth by daylight 
that was gideon's most peculiar adventure and though he never found the tooth or saw old grimble again yet about seven or eight months afterwards when old grimble was discovered all curiously twisted up and dead in bed by the man who took him his breakfast the result of gideon's visit to him came out old grimble had specially put him into his will by some legal method and dr dunstan had gideon into his study three days after old grimble kicked it then was proved that old grimble had left gideon all the things that came over the wall and also a legacy of fifty pounds in money because according to the bit of the will which the father read to gideon out of a lawyer's letter he was the only boy old grimble had ever met with who showed any intelligence above that of the anthropoid ape gideon returned all the balls and things to their owners free of charge but not until the rightful owners proved they were so and the money he sent to his father and his father he told me afterwards was so jolly pleased about the whole affair that he added nine hundred and fifty pounds to old grimble's fifty therefore by shooting gideon's front tooth at a robin slade was actually putting the enormous sum of one thousand pounds into gideon's pocket which i should think was about the rummest thing that ever happened in the world gideon stopped at dunstan's one term after that then he went away and i believe began to help his father to sell diamonds he was fairly good at french and very at german but of other things he knew rather little except arithmetic and his was the most beautiful arithmetic which had ever been done at merivale for i heard stokes who was a seventeenth wrangler in his time tell the doctor so End of story seven. Story eight of the Human Boy by Eden Philpotts. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story eight The Chemistry Class. This story about Guy Fawkes Night at Dunstan's is worth knowing because it shows the rumminess of Nubby Tompkins. Tompkins, I may say, was called Nubby owing to his nose, which was extremely huge, though he said it was Roman and swore he wouldn't change it if he could anyway bradwell made a rhyme about it that is certainly good enough to repeat he wrote it first on a blackboard with chalk and a good many chaps learned it by heart it ran like this our nubby's nose is ponderous and our nubby's nose is long so it wouldn't disgrace our nubby's face if half his nose was gone which was not only jolly good poetry but also true a thing all poetry isn't by long chalks as you can see in virgil and such like well nubs sang the solos in chapel on sundays and people came from far to hear him do it in consequence of which so steggles said the doctor favoured him and regarded him as an advertisement to dunstan's but his singing wasn't in it compared with the advertisement he gave the doctor on guy fawkes night the term before slade left to explain the whole tremendous thing i must tell you that nubs belonged to the chemistry class this class in fact was pretty well started for him his father telling dunstan so nub said that he shouldn't send him at all if he couldn't be taught chemistry because nubs had shown a good deal of keenness for chemicals generally from the earliest days and bought little boxes of serpents eggs and red fire instead of sweets ever since he was old enough to buy anything he had also blown off his eyebrows and eyelashes with a mixture he was grinding up in a mortar and they had never grown again to this day all of which things showed he had chemistry in him to a great extent so the doctor started a chemistry class and a chap called stoddard from merivale came up once a week to take it and nubs joined and so did i not because i had chemistry in me worth speaking of but because i was a chum of nubby's wilson also joined and so did hodges i may mention my name is mathers i always thought that chemists simply mix the muck doctors give you when you're queer but it seems not in fact there are several sorts of chemists and nub said he hoped to belong to the best sort who don't have bottles of red and green stuff in the windows and so on he said a man who sold pills and toothbrushes and licorice root and soap could not be considered a classy chemist the real flyers made discoveries and froze air and sneaked one another's inventions and got knighted by the queen if they had luck and if they were well thought of by the newspapers 
i should think really nubs might come to being knighted if he sticks to it for even down to the stuff in cough lozenges nothing is hid from him once the matron gave me simply a vile lozenge for my throat which got a bit foggy owing to falling into the water during hare and hounds well the lozenge was white in colour but even a white lozenge may be very decent sometimes so i took a shot at it going to bed but it was so jolly frightful to the taste that i chucked it away and next morning found it again and examined it after drying on it i then found the words chlorate of potash so i took it to nubs he said it was certainly a chemical and added that the stuff in it was almost the same as you make pharaoh's serpents with i could hardly believe such a thing so he lighted the lozenge and it burned blue and a long wriggling brownish ash came curling out of it like a snake just as nubby said which is well worth knowing to anybody who ever has a chlorate of potash lozenge many such like remarkable and useful things nubby could tell you among others how to mix sulphur and gunpowder and other ingredients for fireworks he had in fact an awful fine book devoted to the subject and wooden affairs to load cases and once when stoddart didn't turn up and the doctor put us on our honour to do the proper things in the laboratory alone nubbs finished off analysing some mess in about five minutes and spent the complete rest of the time making a rocket it had four blue stars and thirteen yellow ones and the case was made out of a stiff brown paper roll in which his mother had that morning sent nubs a photograph of her new baby at home and nubs forgot the photograph and stuffed the mixture in upon it and made a separate compartment for the stars on top so the photograph of nubby's mother's new baby curiously enough went off with the rocket and was never more seen by mortal eye not that nubs cared he kept the rocket till the doctor's birthday and after prayers when he knew he was in his study with the windows open and the blinds up being summer-time nubs let it off in the front garden and we helped it turned out very good in a way though not quite a perfect rocket because instead of going up it tore along the ground but it tore for an enormous distance and then turned and came back all of itself and the blue stars did not go off but the yellow ones did or some in a bed of rather swagger geraniums unfortunately the doctor didn't care much about it not understanding our motives but nubs explained that he had done it out of honour to the day then the doctor thanked him and said he had doubtless meant well and that from the earliest times of the chinese the pyrotechnist art had been employed upon occasions of legitimate festivity and rejoicing i mention this because it was the encouragement he had over this creeping rocket that made nubs get so above himself if you understand me he never forgot it and next autumn term he actually asked the doctor if he might have a regular firework display in the playground on the night of the fifth of november he asked rather cunningly just after an english history lesson during which the doctor had been slating guy fox frightfully and having said such a heap of hard things about the beggar dr dunstan couldn't very well refuse he said your request is unusual tomkins but i can see no objection at the moment however i will let you have my answer at no distant date and i said to nubbs that means he'll think and think till he's got a reason why you shouldn't and let you know then but nubbs said to me i believe he'll let me do it feeling so jolly bitter as he does about guy fox and blessed if he didn't nubbs undertook to make the things himself nothing was to be bought but chemicals in a raw unmixed condition and dr dunstan actually headed the subscription list with two shillings sixpence and thompson gave the same and mannering two shillings and frenchy three shillings fifty-two chaps also contributed various sums from one shilling to a penny and nubs became rather important and went down gradually to the bottom of the lower fifth owing to the strain upon his mind he gathered together two pounds seven shillings five pence in all and made it up to two pounds ten shillings himself and fowle's father who was in some business where they used sulphur in terrific quantities got four pounds weight of it for nothing and nub said it was a godsend for illuminating purposes he had been to the crystal palace and told us he was going to carry everything out just like they did there as far as he could with the money 
at the last moment he got a tremendous increase of funds in the shape of a pound from his father and strangely enough it was that extra pound that wrecked him without that father's pound he couldn't have arranged the principal feature of the whole performance and without that principal feature nothing in the way of misfortunes to nubs worth mentioning would have fallen out but the pound came and with it a letter very encouraging to nubby he went on mixing away at the various proper compounds and experimenting with them till he got his rockets to go up like larks and his roman candles to shoot out stars the length of a cricket pitch then his governor's pound came and he decided on having a set piece with it a set piece nubby said is the triumph of the firework maker's art and very likely it is in proper hands you can have likenesses in fire or words or ships or fame crowning virtue or in fact pretty well anything a set piece is designed small first then large and it is worked out with little tiny things like squibs only very small and without any bang at the end these are all lighted off at once and they burn one colour first then change to another nub said his would start yellow because it was cheaper and finally turn green the thing was what design to have and the four chaps in the chemistry class all thought differently i advised trying a shot at a huge portrait of the doctor but when it came to particulars nobody knew how to work a portrait and hodges thought we might do something about guy fox but nubs didn't care about that then hodges thought again and suggested the words god bless the doctor and i agreed that it would be fine but wilson said it was profane and might annoy the doctor frightfully especially when it turned green then nub suggested the words dr dunstan is a brick and hodges said that it was good and wilson said it might be good but it wasn't true anyway however it was three to one though we all admitted that from his point of view wilson was right to hate the doctor because the doctor hates him the thing was to make a licking big frame of light wood and arrange the letters across it and the note of exclamation at the end this we did and hammered it against the playground wall and wheeled up the screens that go behind the bowler's arm in the cricket season and hid away the set piece behind them till the time came likewise we arranged stakes for the roman candles and a board for the catherine wheels and a string for the flying pigeons and so on and also we rigged up bits of tin round the playground and by the fir trees at the top end and behind the gym these were for bengal lights and other illuminations all of this nubs had arranged for the paltry sum of three pounds ten shillings the chemistry class had a half holiday as the time drew on and we worked like niggers all four of us nubs commanded so to speak and mixed and did the grinding and pounding and stars hodges and i hammered up the heavy posts and stakes in the playground and carried out odd jobs generally and wilson manufactured cases for everything with brown paper and paste and string the set piece took two hundred and thirteen little tubes these wilson made in lengths of a yard and cut off at the required size and nubs stuffed them with green fire first and yellow on top it promised to be a jolly big thing altogether and four days before the night nubs began to get awfully nervous and to prepare yards and yards of touch paper and corky minimus heard the doctor say to brown really the lads have devoted no little energy and method on their proceedings and it appears so mr stoddart tells me that the boy tomkins has mixed his compounds quite correctly thereby ensuring that brilliance and variety which is looked for in an exhibition of this kind i wonder whether we might ask the parents and friends of those who dwell at merivale and the immediate neighbourhood and brown who never misses a chance of showing the brute he is at heart said really i should think twice dr dunstan there is such an element of chance with amateur fireworks unfortunately we can't have a dress rehearsal as with the scenes from shakespeare and the recitations at the end of the term nevertheless said the doctor i am disposed to run the risk a little harmless pleasure combined with courtesy to relatives at mid-term is rather desirable than not so about fifty people were asked and they brought fifty more and the cads from merivale got to know too and there was a good crowd of them along the fence by the gym 
also two policemen came and nubbs who was nervous before grew much worse when he heard of it besides we had a frightful shock two days before the firework night owing to the loss of poor old wilson by simply sickening luck he got reported by brown for cheek it was when brown came out in a new pair of awfully squeaking boots with sham pearl buttons at the side and drab tops and wilson said they were ugly eighteens and brown heard him the doctor took an awfully grave view of this and told wilson that personality was the vilest kind of cheek which wouldn't have mattered but he gave him a thousand lines as well and forbade him to see the fireworks or help any more with them and that's the man you call a brick wilson said rather bitterly it certainly was rough after the way he had worked but from the wing dormitory where he would be at the time he might be able to see pretty well everything by leaning far out between the window bars which nubbs pointed out to him and he said he should he also said he'd pay out brown some day and very likely dunston too well the night came and it was a fine one and the cads likewise came and lined the fence then the doctor clapped his hands twice which was the signal to begin and just as he did so out burst yellow fire everywhere behind the bits of tin lighted simultaneously by seven chaps and everybody seemed to like it and the doctor said capital bravo tomkins a pleasing and fairy-like conceit then nubbs let fly two rockets and they went up well and burst out in stars though not as many by any means as we had crammed into them but one twisted for some reason and instead of falling in the direction of the cads the stick twinkled down with just a spark of red here and there in the line of it bang behind the chapel both nubbs and i distinctly heard it go smack through the top of the greenhouse and i rather think the doctor heard it too for he didn't say bravo or anything but just sent a kid to tell nubbs to point future rockets the other way which disheartened nubbs because he's like a girl at times of great excitement such as this was but he soon cheered up especially at the splendid success of the catherine wheels which he hadn't hoped much from and at the cheers even the cads gave for the golden rain which showed up everything as bright as day including maud and the other dunston girls and mrs dunston and nubby's father standing smiling very amiably by the doctor and the policeman blinking and the crowd and a white dab hanging out of a high window afar off which i saw and knew to be wilson only the balloon failed owing to the nervousness of nubbs who set fire to the whole show while he was trying to light the spirit on the sponge underneath but he passed it off with crackers thrown among the kids and then while they were all yelling he dragged away the cricket screens and nubbs let off the set piece he lighted the touch paper and it snapped and crackled all over the design in a moment and a thick smoke arose and out of it came the set piece flaring in rich yellow fire of course we expected what nubbs and wilson had arranged viz dr dunston is a brick but instead there came out these awful words dr dunston is a brute that just shows what a frightful difference three letters will make in a thing and the night was so dark and the letters so big that you could have read them a mile off only if you will believe it dunston didn't people applauded like anything at first till the preliminary smoke cleared off and they read the truth then they shut up and made a sound like wind coming through a wood but the cads yelled and roared and so did the policemen for i heard them and to make the frightful thing a shade more frightful if possible the doctor who is blind as ten bats and didn't realize the end of the set piece but only read his name at the top clapped his hands and said famous famous you excel yourself tomkins then the words began gradually to turn green and for that matter so did nubbs in fact whether it was the reflected light or the condition of his mind or both i certainly never saw any chap become so perfectly horrid to look at as nubbs did then his nose seemed to stand out like a great green rock and his eyes bulged and his chin dropped and the set piece turned his teeth as bright as precious emeralds he just merely said good lord nothing more then hooked it off into the darkness simply shattered 
at the same time stoddard and thompson and mannering and brown and some chaps from the sixth not knowing what colour the beastly set-piece might turn next or how soon the doctor would spot it dashed at the thing and dragged it down and trampled on it and brown in the act burned the very boots that wilson had cheeked which pleased wilson a good deal when he heard it after that it was all over and the doctor thinking the set-piece had died a natural death so to speak saw me under the gaslight at the gate as everybody streamed out and said ah young man what was that last word in the illumination i know you and hodges also had a hand in it as well as tompkins and i said please sir we arrange the words dr dunstan is a brick and he said excellent pithy and concise if a little familiar i only hope you all echo that sentiment every one of you send tompkins to me and tell the other fellows there is cake and lemonade going on in the dining hall just as if the other fellows didn't know it but everybody gave three cheers for the doctor and mrs dunstan and i started to find nubs and the policeman made the cads go though they went reluctantly i looked long for nubby and at last found him all alone in the gym one bit of candle was burning which looked frightfully poor after all the brilliance of the fireworks and nubs had got the parallel bars under the flying rings and was standing on them i mean the bars what the dickens are you doing nubby i said and he answered it's no jolly good attempting to stop me now because it's too late my life is ruined and my father was there too to see it ruined and i'm going to hang myself as every convenience for hanging is here mind you he would have done it knowing tompkins as i do and his great ingeniousness i don't mind swearing that he would have been a hung chap in another minute so i told him but though doubtful he decided to put it off anyway i even got him to promise he wouldn't hang himself at all if his father believed his innocence about the set-piece and crew the headmaster under the doctor and old briggs and thompson got us in a corner nubs and hodges and me and we solemnly vowed we knew nothing of it and crew went down to the merivale trumpet and made the reporter put in the original words when it came out and thompson explained to mrs dunstan how some evil disposed wicked person had tampered with the set-piece and begged her not to wound the feelings of the doctor by telling him and the sixth hushed it up among the kids and i sneaked a bit of cake for wilson and went up after the row was over and told him everything down to the burning of brown's boots he confessed to me then that he had done it which didn't surprise me much knowing how he had worked and then at the last minute almost been deprived of seeing the show it was certainly a terrible revenge but of course a terrible revenge which doesn't come off owing to a master being too short-sighted to see it is pretty sickening for the revenger besides the risk mr crewe worked like a demon to find out who had done it and he suspected wilson from the first but couldn't prove it but at last he did find out through fowl who got it out of ferrars who got it out of west who got it out of nubs in a moment of rage for i may say wilson himself told nubs and nubs never forgave him and says he never shall even if they both go to heaven so crewe having found out had some talk with wilson but he didn't lick him whereas wilson did lick fowl and that pretty badly not that fowl cares for an ordinary licking more than another chap cares for a smack on the head the only way to hurt him is to twist his arm round about twice and then hit him hard just above the elbow i may say i found this out myself and everybody does it now End of story eight. Story nine of the Human Boy by Eden Philpotts. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story nine: Doctor Dunstan's Howler. Mind you, if it's interesting to watch any ordinary person come a howler, what must it be to see your own headmaster do it? A howler, of course, is the same as a cropper, and you can come one at cricket or football or in class or in everyday life. Doctor Dunstan's Howler was a most complicated sort and i had the luck to be one of the chaps who witnessed him come it of course to see any master make a tremendous mistake is good but when you are dealing with a man almost totally bald and sixty-two years of age the affair has a solemn side 
especially owing to his being a reverend and a doctor of divinity in fact slade who was with me said the spectacle reminded him of the depths of woe beggars got into in greek tragedies which often wanted half a dozen gods to lug them out of but no gods troubled themselves about dunstan and it really was a bit awkward looked at from his point of view because it's beastly to give yourself away to kids at the best of times and no doubt to him all of us are more or less as kids even the sixth he often had a way of bringing the parents of a possible new boy through one or two of the big classrooms and the chapel of Maryvale, just to show what a swagger place it was. Then we all bucked up like mad, and the masters bucked up too, and gave their gowns a hitch round, and their mortarboards a cock up, and made more noise and put on more side generally, just to add to the splendor of the scene from the point of view of the parents of the possible new boy sometimes the affair was rather spoiled by an aunt or mother or some woman or other asking the doctor homely sort of questions about sanitary arrangements or prayers then to see old dunstan making long-winded replies and getting even the drains to sound majestic was fine his manner varied according to the people who came over the school sometimes if it only happened to be a guardian or a lawyer he was short and stern then he just swept along calling attention to the ventilation and discipline and looking at the chaps as if they were dried specimens in a museum but with fathers or women he had a playful mood and an expression known as the errant smile to mothers he never talked about pupils but called the whole shoot of us his lads and beamed and fluttered his gown like a hen with chickens flutters its wings the masters always copied him and to see that little brute brown trying to flutter over the kids like a hen when the doctor came into his classroom was a ghastly sight knowing him as we did and also the doctor would often pat a youngster on the head and beam at him he generally singled corky minimus out for patting and beaming and corky minor said the irony of it was pretty frightful considering that corky minimus for different reasons got licked oftener by the doctor than almost any chap in the lower school well one day in came the doctor to the schoolroom of the fourth i'm in the sixth myself and a personal chum of slade's the head of the school but i happened to have gone to the fourth with a message so i saw what happened a very big man who puffed out his chest like a pigeon followed the doctor he had a blue tie on with a jolly bright diamond in it and there were small purple veins in a regular network over his cheeks and his moustache was yellowish grey and waxed out as sharp as pins a lady followed him with red rims to her little eyes and gold things hanging about her chest the doctor being all arched up and rolled round from the small of the back like a wood louse seemed to show they were parents of perhaps more fellows than one the big chap wore an eyeglass and spoke very loud and was jolly pleasant ah he said and this is where the little boys work eh? Huh? i expect now my youngster will be drafted in among these small men dr dunstan it is very possible nay probable in the highest degree my lord said the doctor we are now he continued in the presence of the fourth and lower fourth the classroom is spacious as you see and new a commanding panorama of the surrounding country and our playing fields may be enjoyed from the french windows if two of you lads will move that blackboard from there lord golightly may well be able to see something of the prospect two of the kids promptly knocked down the blackboard nearly on to the purple-veined lord's head then suddenly the lady called out and attracted his attention looking round we found she had got awfully excited and stood pointing straight at young tomlin he was a mere kid at the extreme bottom of the lower fourth but he happened to be my fag so i was interested she pointed at him in the most frantic way with a hand in a browny yellow glove and a gold bracelet outside the glove and a little watch let into the bracelet good gracious she said do look ralph what an astounding resemblance whoever is that boy tomlin turned rather red in the gills which was natural do you know the lad asked the doctor never saw him before in my life but i hope he'll forgive me for being so rude as to point at him in that way she said he's exactly like our dear carlo they might be twins 
tomlin thought she meant a pet dog and got rather rum to look at carlo is our son you know explained the lord singular coincidence answered dr dunstan not looking very keen about it in fact he wasn't too fond of tomlin at any time and seemed sorry he should be dragged in now but the kid was a very tidy sort really captain of the third footer eleven and a good runner he happened to be the son of a big london hatter who had a shop of enormous dimensions in bond street and the doctor was said to get his own hats there yet he didn't like tomlin tomlin went out into the open and the purple-veined lord shook hands with him and the lord's wife stood him in the light and turned him round to catch different expressions then they admitted that the likeness was really most wonderful and they both hoped tomlin and carlo would be great friends tomlin told by the doctor to answer stood on one leg twisted his arms in a curious way he's got when nervous and said he hoped they might be but he said it as though he knew jolly well they wouldn't then the lord and the lady cleared out and a week later carlo came his real name was westonleigh and he was a viscount or something being eldest son of an earl but we called him carlo and he grew jolly waxy when he found his nickname had got to merivale before him he fancied himself to a most hideous extent for a kid of nine and explained he'd only come for a year or so before going to eton he went into the lower fourth so tomlin ceased to be at the bottom of that class the likeness between carlo and my fag was really most peculiar it must have been for carlo's own mother to see it but when carlo heard that tomlin would be a hatter in the course of years he refused to have anything to do with him and tomlin loathed carlo too from the start so instead of being chums according to the wish of the purple-veined lord they hated one another and the first licking of any importance which carlo got he had from tomlin the chap was a failure all around and it's no good saying he wasn't everybody saw it but dr dunstan and he wouldn't carlo proved to be a sneak and a liar of the deepest sort not to masters but to the chaps and he was also jolly cruel to animals and very much liked to torture things that couldn't hit him back such as mice and insects he had a square face and snubby nose and a voice and eyes exactly similar to tomlin's but there was no likeness in their characters tomlin being a very decent kid as i have said fellows barred carlo all round and he only had one real chum in the miserable shape of fowl fowl sucked up to him and listened for hours about his ancestors and buttered him at all times hoping of course that some day he would get asked to carlo father's castle in the holidays i may also note carlo never played games excepting tossing behind the gymnasium for half pennies with fowl and steggles steggles of course winning happening one day to go down through the playground young tomlin saw westonleigh near a little fir tree which grew at the top of the drill ground he was alone and seemed to be doing something queer so tomlin stopped and went over what are you up to he said frying ants said carlo though it's no business of yours you see there's turpentine juice come out of this tree where i cut it yesterday and you can stick the ants in it then fry em to a cinder with a burning glass like this that's what you're doing it is don't you think you're rather a little beast what do you mean hatter i mean i'm going to kick you for being such a cruel beast they stood the same height to an inch and were the same age so it was a perfectly sportsmanlike thing for tomlin to offer you seem to forget who you're talking to said carlo no i don't no chance of that your ancestors came over with william the conqueror carried his portmanteau i expect then cleared out when the fighting came on yes and another ancestor stabbed a friend of wat tyler's when he was face down on the ground after somebody else had knocked him over that's what you are aunt fryer i'll thank you to let me pass said carlo i'm not accustomed to talking to people like you and if you think i'm going to fight with a future hatter you're wrong then you can put your tail between your legs and swallow this said tomlin and he went on and licked carlo pretty well he also broke his burning glass 
you'll live to be sorry for this all your life yelled out carlo when tomlin let him get up off some broken flower pots on the drill ground i'll never forget it i'll get my father to make old dunstan expel you and when i'm a man i'll devote all my time to wrecking your vile hat business and ruining you and making you a shivering starving beggar in the streets go and sneak i should said tomlin and blessed if carlo didn't he tore straight off to the doctor just as he was in his licked condition that much i heard from my fag young tomlin but the rest i saw for myself as the six happened to be before the doctor in his study when carlo arrived he was white and muddy and slightly bloody and panting he looked jolly wicked and his collar had carried away from the stud and his trousers were torn behind my good lad whatever has happened began the doctor don't say you've met with an accident and yet your appearance nothing of the sort said carlo who soon found out the doctor had a weak place for him owing to his being a lord's son i've been frightfully and cruelly mangled through no fault of my own and i believe some things inside me are broken too sit down sit down my unfortunate lad said the doctor then he rang the bell and told the butler to bring viscount westonley a glass of wine at once it's tomlin's done it said carlo he came up behind me and before i could defend myself he trampled on me and tried to tear me limb from limb i'm not strong and i may die of it anyway he ought to be expelled and i'll write to my father the earl about it and he'll make the whole countryside resound if tomlin isn't sent away and his character ruined hush westonley said the doctor have no fear that justice will not be done my boy you shall yourself accuse tomlin and hear what he may have to say in defence then tomlin was sent for and in about ten minutes came is this true boy tomlin said the doctor putting on his big manner one glance at your victim he continued furnishes a more conclusive reply to my question than could any word of yours nevertheless i desire to hear from your own lips whether viscount westonley's assertions are true or not don't know what he's asserted sir said tomlin which was a smart thing for a kid to say if he said i've licked him it's true sir that is what he did assert sir in words chosen with greater regard for my feelings than your own and are you aware george tomlin that you have licked one who in the ordinary course of nature and subject to the will of an all-just all-seeing providence will some day take his seat in the house of lords i've heard him say he will sir answered tomlin as though no statement of carlo could be worth believing don't answer in that offensive tone boy answered the doctor his voice rising to the pitch that always went before a flogging if your stagnant sense of right cannot bring a blush to your cheek before the spectacle of your scandalous achievement it will be necessary for me for me your headmaster sir to quicken the blood in your veins and bring a blush to the baser extremity of your person some learn through the head george tomlin some can only be approached through the hide and with the latter category you have long unhappily chosen to throw in your lot tomlin said nothing but looked at carlo before proceeding according to my custom i shall hear both sides of this question audi alteram partem george tomlin now say what you have to say explain why your lamentable your unholy your aboriginal passions led you to fall upon viscount westonley from behind to take him in the rear sir after the unmanly fashion of the north american indian or other primitive savage i didn't take him in the rear at all sir said tomlin i stood right up to him and he said he wouldn't fight a future hatter a very proper decision too sir a natural and wise decision declared the doctor why should the son of lord golightly imbue his hand in the blood of well, i will not say a future hatter for i yield to no man in my respect for your father tomlin and his business is alike honourable and necessary but why should he fight anybody if he's challenged he's got to sir or else take a licking no flippancy sir thundered the doctor again who are you to announce the laws which govern the society of merivale shall it be possible in a christian land at a christian college for christian lads to find infamous boys with tigrine instincts parading the fold for the purpose of smiting when and where they will this sir is the very apotheosis of savagery 
i didn't do it for nothing sir said tomlin i'm not going to sneak of course but i i licked carlo for a jolly good reason and he knows what don't know anything of the sort declared carlo you flew at me like a wolf from behind that's a good one answered tomlin anybody can see you did from the state i'm in said carlo you two boys began the doctor again though you know it not stand here before me as types of a great social movement i may even say upheaval in the democratic age upon which we are now entering we shall find the tomlins at war with the westonleys we shall find the westonleys disdaining to fight and the tomlins accordingly doing what pleases them in their own brutal way now here i find myself met with statement and counterstatement the indictment is all too clear against you boy tomlin for even the glass of old brown sherry which he has just consumed fails to soothe your unfortunate victim's nerve centres he is still far from calm his ganglions are yet vibrating this work of destruction was yours you do not deny it but you refuse any explanation making instead a vague and ambiguous reference to not sneaking no man hates the tale-bearer more than your headmaster sir but there are occasions when the school's welfare and the protection of our little commonwealth make it absolutely necessary that offences should be reported to the ruler of that commonwealth i have no hesitation in saying that westonleigh saw the present incident in this light he had no right to hush up the matter whatever his private instincts towards mercy his duty to his companions and to me together with a hereditary sense of justice and the fearless instincts of his race compelled him to come before me and report the presence of a young garroter in our midst i select the word george tomlin and i say that having regard to the perverted not to say inverted sense of justice and honour all too common among every community of boys westonleigh's act was a brave act i accept his statement in its entirety consequently tomlin you may join me this evening at nine o'clock after prayers that meant a flogging and tomlin said yes sir and hooked it but the wretched carlo thought he was going to hear tomlin expelled he burst out and said as much and the doctor started as if a serpent had stung him and told carlo to control the instinct of revenge so common to all human nature and explained that chaps were not expelled for trifles he reminded carlo that tomlin had an immortal soul like himself and seemed to imply that being expelled from merivale would ruin a chap's future in the next world as well as this one finally he allowed carlo in consideration of the dressing he had got to stop in the playground that afternoon with a book so the little skunk crept off shattered ganglions and all pretending to walk lame while the doctor evidently much bothered altogether took up our work where he had left it tomlin got flogged all right and there the matter ended excepting that a lot of fellows sent carlo to coventry and called him ant friar from that day then within three weeks came the doctor's howler steggles being responsible steggles is a bit of a hound but his cunning is wonderful as for the doctor he continued making much of carlo and sitting on tomlin till one day going into chapel he unexpectedly patted tomlin on the head tomlin was rather pleased because he thought the doctor was relenting to him but when steggles heard of it he said why you fool he thought he was patting westonly then on an evening when tomlin was cooking a sausage for me in the sixth classroom he said please i should like to speak to you if i may so i chucked work and told him to say what he liked it's only to show how things go against a chap no matter what he does said the kid this term i have been flogged for licking carlo and caned three times since for other things which were more bad luck than anything else and now i'll be flogged again to-morrow for absolute certain why well it's a jolly muddle you know steggles yes you're a fool to go about with him i said perhaps i was anyway steggles and me made a plot to get some of the medlars from the tree on the lawn and we minced out after dark to do it they're simply allowed to fall and rot on the ground which is a waste of good tuck steggles says we went out about ten o'clock last night past brown's study window and we looked in from the shrubbery to see the window open and soda water and whiskey and pipes on the table but no brown strange to say 
then we sneaked on and steggles suddenly heard something and got funky but i kept him going we reached the tree and steggles lighted his bull's-eye lantern so as to collect the medlars when suddenly out from behind the tree itself rushed a man we hooked it like lightning naturally and i never saw steggles go at such a pace in my life and he stuck to his lantern too but i tripped and fell and before i could get up the man had collared me if you'll believe it the man was brown he asked me who the other chap was and i said i couldn't be quite sure so he told me to go back to bed which i did that was last night and the one medlar we had time to get steggles had eaten before i got back which shows you what steggles is to-day brown will tell the doctor he always chooses the evening after prayers so that he can work the doctor up with his stories and get a chap flogged right away because it often happens when dr dunston says he'll flog a chap next day he doesn't do it and what is steggles going to do he says he is watching events he also says that brown was certainly stealing the doctor's medlars himself and really we surprise him not he us but of course steggles says it's no good my telling the doctor that steggles also says that he's got an idea which may come to something i don't know but he's a very cute chap i've got to keep out of the way after prayers to-night and steggles is going to watch brown he won't tell me his plan i thought once that perhaps he meant giving himself up for me and i asked him and he said i ought to know him better tomlin then cleared out and as the doctor took slade and me for a short greek lesson every evening after prayers because of special examinations i had the good luck to see the end of the business that very night we just got to work by the doctor's green-shaded reading lamp when brown came in with his grovelling way pretending he was awfully sorry for having to round on tomlin but that his duty gave him no option and so on last night he said i was sitting correcting exercises in my study when i fancied i saw a form steal across the grass outside thinking some vagabond might be in the grounds i dashed out and followed as quickly as possible presently i saw a light and noted two figures under the medlar tree fearing they might be plotting against the house i went straight at them and to my astonishment saw that they were only boys one darted away and i failed to catch him the other i much regret to say was tomlin that is how brown put the affair tomlin again exclaimed the doctor positively that boy's behaviour passes the bounds of endurance yes taking the medlars of one who has always treated him as you have i couldn't trust myself to speak to him he's a very disappointing boy he's a disgraceful degenerate disreputable boy i can forgive much but the stealing of fruit and that my fruit greediness immorality ingratitude in the person of an outrageous lad i thank you brown yours was a zealous act and argued courage of high order oblige me by sending tomlin hither at once there shall be no delay brown hurried off to find the wretched tomlin and dr dunston who always had to work up his feelings before flogging a chap snorted like a horse and took off his glasses and went to the corner behind the bookcase where canes and things were kept he seemed to forget slade and me so we sat tight in the gloom outside the radius of light thrown by the green-shaded lamp and waited with regret to see tomlin catch it the doctor talked to himself as he brought out a birch and swished it through the air once or twice pon my soul he said lord golightly's son was right his knowledge of character is remarkable in so young a lad tomlin will have to be expelled tomlin must go such consistent such inherent depravity appears ineradicable pruning is of no avail the branch must be sacrificed my medlars under cover of darkness and i would have given them freely had he but asked he evidently wasn't going to expel tomlin this time but he meant doing all he knew with the birch and as tomlin was some while coming the doctor's safety valves were regularly humming before he turned up when he did come he walked boldly in and the doctor who had been striding up and down like a lion at the zoo didn't wait for any remarks but just went straight for him seized him by the nape of the neck nipped his hand round his back in a way he did very neatly from long practice and began to administer about the hottest flogging he'd given to any boy in his life so you add the eighth 
commandment to the others you have already shattered deplorable boy roared the doctor giving tomlin one between each smack you would purloin steal rob the medlars of your preceptor you would lead others to share your sin you would bring tears of grief to a good mother's eyes here the doctor stopped a moment for breath but he still held on to tomlin who much to my surprise wriggled about a good deal in fact he shot out his legs over and over again at intervals like a grasshopper does when it gets into the water and when he got a chance he yelled back at the doctor it's a lie a filthy lie he shrieked out beast devil let me go let me go i never touched your rotten old medlars oh oh then the doctor went off again silence miserable child cease your blasphemies falsehood will not save you now i never touch them i tell you you muddle-headed old beast you're killing me and my father'll imprison you for life for it i wish they would hang you i'll make you smart for this if you only live till i grow up devil but the doctor had shot his bolt he gave tomlin a final smack then shook him off like a spider picked up his mortar-board which had fallen off in the struggle and put the birch in its place now go and don't speak another word or i shall expel you wretched lad meantime slade and i were fairly on the gasp for from the time that tomlin as we thought had called the doctor a devil we realized the truth now his passion nearly choked him he danced with pain and rage only when the doctor took a stride towards him he opened the door and hooked it the doctor puffed up and grunted like a traction ended trying to get up a hill these are the black days in a headmaster's life slade he said that misguided lad thinks that i enjoyed administering his punishment yet both mentally and physically the operation caused me far greater suffering than it brought to him i am wounded wounded to the heart and the exertion causes and will cause me much discomfort for hours to come owing to its unusual severity i may say that not for ten years has it been necessary for me to flog a boy as i have just flogged george tomlin now let us proceed i couldn't have broken it to him but slade did he said please sir it wasn't tomlin not tomlin not tomlin what do you mean boy who was it then said the doctor his eyebrows going up to his forehead which was all quite dewy from the hard work it was young carlo i mean westonley said slade viscount westonley gasped the doctor his mouth dropping right open in a very rum way by itself if you understand me yes sir then why in the name of heaven didn't you say so how dare you stand there and watch me commit an offence against law and justice how did you dare to watch me ignorantly torture an innocent boy and that boy go both of you you slade and you butler also go instantly and send brown and viscount westonley to me good god this is terrible terrible so that was his howler and to see him in his chair looking so old and haggard and queer was rather frightful he seemed suddenly struck with limpness and his hands shook like anything and so did his bald head and he puffed as if he'd been running miles and slade said afterwards that he looked jolly frightened too he put his face in his hands as we went out and we heard him say something about lord golightly and ruin and universal opprobrium on his grey hairs though really he had none worth mentioning and slade said he almost thought the doctor was actually going to cry if such a thing could be possible we sent brown off to him but carlo wasn't to be found he'd been yelling somewhere but couldn't be traced what had happened was this tomlin in obedience to steggles had kept rather close after prayers in fact he had spent the half hour to bedtime in a cupboard in the gymnasium under the rubber shoes so brown not finding him had told the first boy he saw to do so and that boy happened to be steggles who had been at his heels ever since he went to the doctor steggles is a miserable unwholesome thing but his strategy certainly comes off once having the message all was easy because steggles merely found carlo and told him the doctor wanted him 
the result was much better than even steggles hoped because though the doctor generally fell on a chap who came to be flogged straight away like he did on carlo it wasn't often anybody got such a frightful strong dose as carlo had afterwards when taxed steggles swore of course that he thought he was talking to tomlin seeing the likeness this might have been perfectly true though in their secret hearts everybody knew steggles too jolly well to really believe it carlo didn't turn up and after an hour or more of frantic rushing about somebody said perhaps he'd jumped down the garden well owing to the indignity of what he'd got but soon afterwards in reply to a special telegram sent for the doctor by the people at the railway station an answer came from golightly towers twenty miles off where the purple-veined lord father of carlo hung out the kid it seemed had sloped down to merivale railway station after his licking and taken a ticket right away for golightly and gone home by the last train but one that night he never returned either but next day his father dropped in on dr dunstan and fowl managed to hear a little of what went on through the keyhole he said that as far as he could make out the lord didn't think much of the matter and said one thrashing more or less wouldn't mar carlo but the lord's wife who didn't come evidently took the same view as carlo for he never returned to dunstan's again the doctor's howler ended in his losing the little bounder altogether which with his views about lords in general and especially earls might have been frightfully rough on him as to tomlin actually the doctor never flogged him after all i think his spirit had got a bit broken and though tomlin went at the end of the term he wasn't expelled but withdrawn by mutual consent like you hear of things in parliament sometimes he wouldn't have gone at all but he refused to say who was under the medlar tree with him and stuck to it and steggles absolutely declined to give himself up because as he truly said he had more than kept his promise to tomlin about helping him out of the mess so tomlin went he was a very decent little chap indeed and nearly all the fellows at dunstan's promised faithfully to buy their hats entirely at his place in bond street london when they left school which will be very good business for him if they do as for the doctor it's a peculiar fact that for a whole term after carlo's affair he never flogged a single chap he didn't seem to have any heart in him somehow owing to the rum way the howler told upon his spirit end of story nine